Hi, I'm Paige Listerud for ChicagoTheaterBlog.com, and we're here at Raven Theater with artistic director Mike Menendian, who is also the director of the current production of Death of a Salesman. Thank you for agreeing to speak with us, Mike. Uh, it's my pleasure. Okay. Um, we're noticing a lot of productions coming up this 2009-2010 season uh, that are Arthur Miller inspired. Um, you know, what was the process behind deciding on Death of a Salesman this year? Well, it was actually a roundabout decision. We had, we wanted to revisit one of our uh, favorite plays from the past that we'd done. Raven Theater has been around for quite a while, and we've never remounted a show. Um, but we've had great success with Arthur Miller in the past, and initially we wanted to do All My Sons as a remount. And uh, as it turned out, another company had the rights to it, so we couldn't do it. And our next closest choice was uh, Death of a Salesman. Not as if Death of a Salesman was our second choice. Uh, certainly, uh, I would say Death of a Salesman is my first choice as a play all all around. It's my favorite play, but uh, we just felt that the time was right at that time to do All My Sons, and when that wasn't available, we just skipped over to, to um, Death of a Salesman. And I was completely unaware of the fact that there were um, other companies in Chicago doing other Miller plays other than All My Sons, and then I read something in the paper that there were like three or four other productions of Arthur Miller, and as a matter of fact, yesterday I was buying carpeting of all things, and uh, <laughs> the salesman who sold me the carpeting it works at Eclipse Theater, and I found out that they're doing Arthur Miller as their season coming up in the uh, 2010 calendar year. So apparently Miller's uh, back again. Miller's back in a yeah. big way, certainly yeah. in Chicago. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had noticed also that Raven had done Death of a Salesman yeah. in 1995. That's right. Uh, anything from that production that you're kind of carrying forward into this one, or just two totally different <clears throat> productions altogether? Well, I, they're, they're two very different productions altogether. Uh, I can't help but remember that production. That was that had a profound impact on me back then, and that was a very successful show commercially for us. It ran for oh almost six months in the old space, um, and uh, but the dynamics are so different today. It's a completely different cast, of course. The only connection to that project is that uh, Chuck Spencer, who plays Willie Loman, played the role of Ben oh, really? back then. Wow. So the irony is that 14 years ago, he played Willie Loman's older brother, and now that he's 14 years older, he's playing Ben's <laughs> younger brother. What a coincidence. Yeah. He gets to be the character talking to the character he played. Yes. That was his vision of success and exactly. you know, yeah. achievement. Amazing. Yeah. That's really quite a coincidence. Yeah. Um, your interpretation of Death of a Salesman is fairly traditional. I went back and looked at the play, and it does follow through with a lot of the sound effects and other stage directions that are, that are at least in the common you know, published versions of Death of a Salesman. Um, but I couldn't help feeling that your production here at Raven had a much more impressionistic, less less jarring, less you know frenetic, much more softer, more impressionistic um, take the, on the story. Than the, than when you read the script. Than when itself. I read the script itself. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's really a lot of it is a coincidence. I mean, we uh, it's come up before recently. Uh, I re I just spoke to a group of students at Loyola University, and they wondered why I had not chosen to do something more um, theatrically, I would say, uh, jarring, something more out there. And uh, Death of a Salesman is a play that I know backwards and forwards, and um, I felt that to be true to the story, there's a, there's a real specific story there, and I didn't feel as, as if I needed to, uh, I needed to make a visually, dramatically different interpretation, but I made many subtle interpretations that were different from what's in the script. Uh, took liberties here and there when the boys chime in that Uncle Charlie's not well liked. That's not in the script exactly, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I made it a mantra of the family, uh, and so that it's something that they've. It's been drilled into their heads so much mm -hmm. that they they know that uh, the. Um, some other elements of it, I mean, it's not really clear with lighting, it's not really clear with the underscore of uh, music and other elements that 
is really part of the script. It's not like you have to do any lighting changes. You don't have to do any kind of a musical thing other than the flute that uh, comes up in the script itself. But mm-hmm. even that we took liberties with. We, did, we weren't exactly on the moments of whenever you read it in any particular script saying, now the flute appears as a memory of Ben. or you know. So mm-hmm. there are little subtle changes that aren't part of the script. But I didn't feel it was my place to, uh, to do something that was so visually arrestingly different that you'd go, oh my God, what, what story is this? You mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. Part of me felt that, well, if I want to do something like that, then I probably wouldn't do Death of a Salesman. I'd do another play that lent itself to a lot more of a you know, physical interpretation that might be different from the script. It still manages uh, all, the, all the technical aspects of the scene design and the sound design, the music and the lighting. They, they still add up to something very evocative, though. It's not... It's not in your face. It's more going to elicit and draw out, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a dreamlike qualities, uh, you know, in in the uh, production. Um, I I was at, uh, told that Leif uh, Olsen is the guy who wrote, uh, composed the the musical score right. for this production. Yes. yes. Uh, the music is haunting. Yeah. It's really quite haunting. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> Leif and I have worked together for over 10 years, and he's a member of the core member of the Raven Ensemble. And uh, this was a show that really spoke to him when he read the script. He was really very moved by it, very affected by it. So um, we would sit down many times. He'd play me a theme, and then we'd discuss the theme, and then we'd go back um, into the script. We'd go page by page, and where we felt it needed a little boost, or what kind of a boost it needed. The, the shift in music from Act 1 to Act 2 is dramatically different. It goes mm-hmm. from very very intimate, very internal, to something that's very expressionistic with the, uh, the modern jazz of, of the late 40s that had sprung up in America. He used that theme for the uh, opening of Act 2 and just kind of blowing it out of Brooklyn into New York City, into Manhattan, mm-hmm. and giving it the sense that now this man, Willie Loman, is going to venture into the jungle of Manhattan and, you know, uh, attempt to, um, you know, fix things that are wrong. And it seems a a jungle that uh, his son, Happy, might be a little more adapted to than he is, but I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later.